Hello everybody, welcome to our program again today. Uh, my name is Pastor Steve Green. This is Bretton Ward of Faith Church. My wife Penny and I pastor here today is Sunday, October 8th. And we are thrilled to have you with us today. Our subject today is simple, but not necessarily easy, Roman numeral two. We did the first um, of these messages with this title almost a month ago, and I really like that idea. I think it communicates a lot that that faith is something that is simple, uh, but not necessarily easy. There's a part of it that's very challenging, but the principle is easy, and the principle uh, being easy, uh, understanding that is meant to encourage us, not to frustrate us or to um, make us angry because, you know, how can something so simple be hard to do, but but the simplicity of it is something that can encourage us and help us and motivate us as we work through whatever issues we have with it. So we'll get into that. But first of all, I want to go back to something else that we did previously, going back another couple or three months, and that is a series we did on conversations. And I want to come back to that again because it's uh, such a big deal. It's um, part of our life, part of our calling, and that is to share the gospel with other people. And so we had a series called Conversations. And I want to uh, mention some more conversations uh, recently and touch again on some of the key points to help make conversations with people um, easier, to make it so that we can uh, transition out of a normal conversation, what we could call a normal one, into a spiritual or out of a natural conversation into a spiritual conversation. Uh, a month or two ago in August, I uh, saw an ultrasound technician. I, um, I needed to have an ultrasound done. And so uh, she was right out of school. She was being trained. Uh, there was a more experienced technician that was there, but he was only there for part of the time. Um, and while we were talking, uh, she commented that she believed that the single mo ne most necessary thing for uh, the human race today is that we would have more empathy for one another. That was her belief. And it, it sounded to me um, almost a little spiritual. I didn't quite know where she was coming from, uh, what exactly she meant by that. I know what the word empathy means, but still there could be something uh, underpinning that belief. So I asked her, and uh, this is something that I was um, mentioning here in the series a few months ago, is a story I like, our story, uh, a question I like to ask people is, what is your faith story? And uh, although that sounds on the surface like perhaps an awkward question, when I first heard it, I thought of it that way. It, is, it has been surprising to me how people respond to that question. Literally over and over and over again, um, if I just ask that question as if it's the most normal question in the world, like everybody has a faith story, uh, people answer it as if that is the case, as if um, everybody does have a faith story. Uh, very occasionally somebody will say, well, um, nothing. <laughs> but even that's an answer. That's a, a good answer in that it gives us good information to go by. So I asked her, what's her faith story? And she said she was raised Catholic. I mentioned again back when we were doing that series, that is the most common answer that I get. Um, and so uh, this was <clears throat> not, we didn't have a lot of time she needed to do what she needed to do, do the whole ultrasound thing. Um, so we only made it a little bit further in the conversation, but in that conversation I was able to get to the key thought, and, and uh, that is the word of reconciliation. Although she was raised Catholic, she did not know, did not understand what Paul calls the word of reconciliation. We get that out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19 from the Amplified Bible. It says it was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not holding, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them. Now, that is how it reads in the verse. That's the Amplified Version. Um, we don't need to quote the verse. In fact, I would be inclined to think it's better not to quote the verse. If we come across like we're quoting a verse, then it becomes a little less conversational. So, um, uh, in, in talking with people, being involved in conversations, that's what we're calling this segment of our message today, conversations. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I prefer just to state it in regular language. So, for example, we could say, well, 
The reason Jesus died on the cross was God put our sins, my sin, your sin, everybody's sins on him. He paid the penalty. He paid the price so that you and I can be restored to favor with God. So uh, that would be a way of putting it. Uh, and so that is the number one thing. That's the word of reconciliation. That's the ministry every believer has. We, we have different gifts, different ministries, but that is a ministry we all have, which is the ministry of reconciliation, which is to find a way in an open-hearted, conversational way to share with people that Jesus has done this. Jesus has taken their sins. He's borne the weight. He's borne the penalty. He's paid the price uh, in order that we can be restored to favor with God. And then there doesn't have to be um, certainly any argument about it. It's just something we leave with people. If they're not ready to act on it right now, we can leave that with people and they can just meditate that or ponder it or think about it, that God would do this. How do you argue against a God who is willing to stand in your place, pay the price for your sin in order that you would be restored to favor with God. That is an awesome thing. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, if we have the opportunity to share with uh, whoever we're speaking with that it is not automatic, meaning that there needs to be a response. And of course, that involves uh, asking Jesus to be the Lord of our life, to enter into our heart, to live with us, to live in us, to be our Lord. That is how we respond in faith to the fact that He has done this for us. So that was the, that was the extent of that conversation. I just returned from a trip. I wasn't here in church. Uh, a week ago, uh, we had a guest minister. I was um, in various places involving a number of different uh, airplane trips. And um, one of them was on a plane from Toronto to Detroit. And I was seated next to an apprentice carpenter. Now, I want to emphasize this, is I do not view a plane as a place where I'm strapped in, the person next to me is strapped in, they can't get away, <laughs> they're a prisoner uh, there for a while, and I can, um, I can just say whatever I want because they're stuck. In fact, um, my most preferred thing naturally to do on a plane is to just be in my own bubble, uh, mind my own business, uh, just focus on what it is I want to focus on, something I'm reading, something I'm studying, um, whatever it is, and just be in my own little world and mind my own business. Uh, that being said, um, if there are opportunities, I'm excited about it. Uh, and I believe that the Lord is encouraging me about this, um, and He's encouraging all of us about this. And so, um, sometimes on flights, I'll just, again, just hardly say a word to the person next to me. But on other occasions, it just seems like doors are opening, and I'll give an example of that. So this man, young man, 25, 30 years old, somewhere in there, married, a son and a daughter, small children, a good talker. He was going, he's from Ontario, he's going to Las Vegas. This was just a, one of uh, a couple of flights, I assume, getting him there. And uh, it was a trip funded by his union, and there were going to be some training sessions, but he was going to receive his full wages for the week um, as if he was working. He was also going to receive all trip expenses paid, plus he was going to get $400 spending money, and so he did not see any reason why he shouldn't do it. Um, it was his choice whether he went or not, uh, but he thought this is just all for the good. Um, <clears throat> And uh, he said later, not when he first told me, but later he said his wife was concerned. <laughs> What's, what all is going to happen on this trip? Um, so uh, he, he mentioned that from his hall, he, I think, was the only person going. So it's not like everybody gets to go on this trip, but he was one that was selected. Um, so one of the things that came up in conversation with him um, was... Um, well, here, I won't mention that, um, uh, but, but there were, were some things that um, uh, indicated to me he might be a person that morality uh, was important to, that maybe had uh, some kind of a faith background. So I asked him, again, same thing I asked uh, the ultrasound technician. I said, so what's your faith story? And he said he was raised Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I keep getting that all the time. And so I asked him, well, 
Um, and sometimes this question doesn't follow immediately on the heels of whatever answer I get, but um, I asked him if he died today and I did not expect that he was going to do that. We were on a plane. Um, I said, where would he go? What would happen to him? Um, now I forget his answer. That would be a good part of the story if I remembered his answer, but I forget. Um, but he did say, though, that um, later in the conversation that the evening before, he was having anxiety about going on a plane trip. Uh, and he said out loud, this is what he said. Now, this is when he's by himself the evening before. He said out loud that he would end up sitting next to a pastor and, and then he would be safe. And then he said to me, and here you are. So, so this is what I want to encourage you with. Um, God is invested in this. He has more at stake than we do. He cares more than we do. And it's not all on our shoulders to make this work. He wants to work with us. So this man came uh, to that uh, airport and boarded that plane with some kind of thought that he would be sitting next to a pastor. Um, and, and to my understanding from talking to him, I don't know that he was a Christian. Um, uh, and so he was uh, a little bit he, was, he thought it was very remarkable that this is, in fact, is, is what happened. Now, in our conversation, he talked about, so you can see there's a, an open door there. He talked about, um, we were talking about spiritual things, so he mentioned things. He mentioned his grandmother who had passed away not long in the past, I don't know, in the last couple of years. She had been a big fan of the Blue Jays, Toronto Blue Jays, and and that since her death they had been noticing. Whereas there were that they were living in a in a treed area where there was a number of trees, and where there used to be one type of birds predominating. After she died, there turned out that there was more Blue Jays coming, and so they thought that this was perhaps a sign or an indication that she was somehow there or watching over them. And he mentioned another thing that. Um, that he thought was a faith type of thing. He, he said that for some reason, the, the number three uh, in succession three times, like three, 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 it had some significance that they couldn't quite put their finger on. Nevertheless, it would keep popping up and they thought it meant something. Like for example, they, they might, he might call his parents. This was a, a thing that he, um, he got from his parents and they'd be starting to, and they'd be starting to talk and they'd look at their watch and it was 333 and there it is again it's those numbers um, and so this could get distracting right um, this could be well no 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 that's <laughs> that's not it that's not important uh, you don't need to pay attention to that but again what is important it's always going to be the word of reconciliation so i shared that with him that jesus died on the cross for his sins paying the price so that he wouldn't have to so he could be restored to favor with god um, and then he started sharing about how he and his wife had seriously been discussing uh, starting to go to church. This was something, that there was a bit of a, a barrier, you know, to start doing something different on a Sunday morning and which church would he go to and they weren't sure if it would be the Catholic church. And, and, and so I encouraged him that that would be a good step, a necessary step and uh, didn't, didn't tell him to go or not to go to the Catholic church, but gave him some thoughts about how to select a good church. Uh, and so that was um, our conversation there. I didn't get a chance to pray with him to receive the Lord, but definitely sowed some good seeds later in the trip on another plane trip. And what is it about plane trips? Um, not trying to trap people, but maybe it's just the fact that you're seated next to somebody that you don't know that, um, and for an extended period of time, which is a little bit of an unnatural thing. It doesn't happen in life. You know, we're busy. We go, go, go. And, and, and we don't have time maybe for a lot of these things. So, so that, that might be why it might happen a little bit more on plane trips, but this one was a flight from Los Angeles to Edmonton returning. And um, uh, the lady, maybe in her 50s somewhere, a Canadian citizen living in the Los Angeles area now, a school district administrator, so um, a fairly high up in the school system. Um, she also married, also son and daughter, adult son and daughter, also a good talker, um, flying home. Uh, which was northern Alberta, where she's from, so home in a sense, flying back to her childhood home to attend her father's funeral, who uh, uh, he had just passed away. And, and she, uh, like this man I had spoken to, not a church attender, um, 
and yet believed in God in some way, maybe a vague way. She was angry with God, angry about her father's death. She had been talking to God and expressing over a number of days since she had heard about his death, preparing for the trip back home, expressing to him how angry she was with him, that because of um, the circumstances of her father's death and, and whatever reasons. And so she said, she looked at me and she said, just like that young man said on the plane, she said, and here you are. In other words, she interpreted my presence there as God answering her <laughs> and her complaints against him, like this was a response from God. <laughs> and so again, there's nothing that I'm doing to set these up. I mean, how in the world would I ever arrange these type of things? I'm just there, I just, I just walk into it. Um, and again, I want to encourage you that this is what God wants to do with all of us. He wants to, you and I, to walk into situations that have already been prepared for us. And, and the only thing is we need to be uh, prepared at our end. And the key thing, and you can gather this, I'm emphasizing this, is we need to be ready to share what the Bible calls the word of reconciliation. In other words, to simply let people know that God was personally present in Christ reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself. He's not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but he has canceled them um, in whatever language you would choose to express that. This is what we need to be ready to do. And if a person's ready to believe that and, and accept that, and, and um, they're willing to, to respond uh, to God uh, according to how he wishes us to respond, which is then to uh, allow him, invite him to become who he rightfully is, the Lord of our life, um, then we can lead them in a prayer like that. Uh, so um, I asked her, uh, seeing as she's talking about God, she's been angry with God, and here I am now. I, so I asked her, what's your faith story? It's just, again, <laughs> the simple ideas being repeated again and again from story to story. Um, she said she was raised uh, Catholic. <laughs> so again, uh, um, I, I asked if she died today and, and I did not expect she was going to. Where would she go? She said, a little different from the man on the earlier flight, uh, she said she thought she would go to heaven uh, because she had lived a good life. And, and that was a, a good time for me to share with her the word of reconciliation, how it is that we go to heaven, which is Jesus dying on the cross for us which as much as she may have thought she was a good person, that's a better message. So uh, I'm not, uh, and I don't think we need to fight with people, argue with people. I didn't need to contend with that man that, no, those blue jays don't mean anything. Uh, 333 doesn't mean, it. I don't need to. I can just listen, understand. It's useful information, know where they're at, what they're thinking, know what step they need to take next. Um, but it's not a point of dispute. Uh, and I didn't need to dispute with her how good a person she was or not. Simply share the word of reconciliation. Other thoughts that came up um, was uh, God I didn't believe, and I explained myself, did not make her father sick. This would be God's answer to her anger. Um, our son, uh, when he was healed of an incurable, incurable bowel disease, um, I shared that story. She said something interesting. She said she thought that the human race, that we all are basically evil, which is quite uh, a good thing. Um, it's not good that we're basically evil, but to realize that uh, most people think we're basically good and that sets us at odds with God right from the start. So interesting conversation. So key thoughts when it comes to uh, speaking to people, conversations like we're talking about is ask questions, be a good listener, don't, don't dominate the conversation, don't do most of the talking. Uh, you don't have to pose as anything, be anything, say anything that in some way or form hints uh, at, you know, how good you are or it gives you some status, uh, something you want people to know so, uh, so that they will recognize you as a good person. You don't need to do that. It's better if you don't. Just be relaxed, have an open heart. And as we've been emphasizing, always go back to the word of reconciliation. And even if you've shared that already in the conversation and the conversation wanders around a bit after that, then bring it back, circle around, repeat that again. That's the main thing a person who is not a Christian yet needs to know is the word of reconciliation. So now coming back to our series, 
on faith. Uh, let's read Acts chapter 14, verses 7 to 10. And they were preaching the gospel there. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. And this man heard Paul speaking, and Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet, and he leaped and walked. So we've been talking for a number of weeks, um, maybe a couple of months now, about faith, and uh, in particular, uh, more than anything else, faith and healing, healing for our physical body. But a lot of emphasis on faith, how faith works, what it is. So, so let me review. It's been a few weeks now. We talked about the thorn in the flesh, and then I was gone for a week. Uh, so it seems like it's been a while since we've been talking about the essentials of faith. So let's go back over and remind ourselves. Uh, number one, we began by observing many scriptures that point to God's will to save people. We're talking about initial salvation, uh, becoming a Christian, being forgiven of our sins, being made a new creature. Um, we saw numerous scriptures. There were about a dozen of them. So this is how, in all subjects, not just that subject, that subject is a good example and we're using it, but this is how we determine the will of God. It's not by how things appear to us. It's not what we think, not what we feel, but it's what the scripture says. The scripture, what it says, uh, if there are issues where God has a firm immovable standing on that issue, then we find out that he has that stand based upon what we read in the scripture. So that is how faith is going to come. Faith begins where the will of God is known. If we don't know the will of God in a certain area, then we can't have faith in that area. Faith isn't just sort of blundering along, uncertain of the will of God, but whatever he thinks, whatever he wants, then I guess he'll do it. That isn't, that is sometimes described as faith, but that isn't faith. Faith is when there is some certainty, there's clarity. We know what God wants because he has clearly stated and repeatedly stated what he wants. So that subject of him wanting men to be saved, he's ready to forgive us our sins. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That is a, an area where he has abundantly made his will known. And so we can have faith in that area. We do not look at all the sinners around us in the world and try to gauge God's will um, to save sinners by how many people are still sinners. Um, that you could never, that would never work. We need to go to the scriptures. So that's the first and maybe the most important thing, very simple, but most important thing we can learn about faith is faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Uh, and we gave a number of uh, other examples um, about how God takes a stand on issues. In addition to Him wanting everybody saved, we looked at how He is with us. As born-again believers, He is with us. Um, another one is He wishes to bless our food. We don't need to wonder if these things are His will or not. They are his will. So another important thing, and, and more than important, just incredibly important. I shouldn't say incredibly. Incredibly means hard to believe. <laughs> and believing is what we're, what we're trying to do. Um, but, but faith releases the power of God to do as he wishes. So then, that, that means that what God wishes to do, he does not automatically do. Because he is waiting, he is dependent upon us to believe that he wants us to do it. And then that is the open door for him to do it in our lives. It's a collaborative thing. It's interactive. It's relational. It's not just God uh, arbitrarily, independently doing what he wants. He's looking for our participation. Huge. Uh, obviously, this is huge because uh, if, if this is a, the case, and there's a, a many scriptures that indicate that it's the case, then if we're just waiting for God to do what he wants and he's waiting for us to believe, we could be waiting for a long time. We need to get involved. We need to believe what he says. If he's taken a stand, our it's back and forth. It's relational. If he's taken a stand on an issue, we need to believe that he has taken a stand on that issue. We read in Hebrews 4, 2, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, 
So this gospel word, the good will of God, this good word does not profit us. It did not profit them. And he, the writer is saying it applies to us as well. It did not profit them not being mixed with faith in those that heard it. So whatever God wants to do, it's when we mix our faith with what he wants to do that permits him to do it. Even John 3.16, one of the best known scriptures in the Bible, says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, but we need to believe in that in order for it to become effective for us, or in the language of Hebrews 4 too, that it would profit us. Praise God. So, so these are the things that we've been emphasizing. Um, we, we know the will of God because the Bible says what the will is. We need to believe what the Bible says because that releases God to do what His will, are, will is. Um, a third thing, His will, uh, this is, we're talking about faith across the board, but in particular healing. So God's will is for the healing of our physical bodies. Uh, we need to know that. We read in 1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, talking about salvation, Jesus dying for our sins. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. In Isaiah 53.4 in the HCSB, uh, yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pain. So the, so the scripture tells us he bore our sins. That means he wishes for us not to live in those sins anymore. He also bore our sicknesses and carried our pains. Same crucifixion, same cross, same time, same place. Did the same thing, only it's sicknesses and pains instead of sins and, and indicating that this is His will for us. Praise the Lord. Uh, now, uh, when it comes to faith, here's another thing that we emphasized is that um, a lack of faith is our starting position. So this is no surprise. We can have faith across a range of issues. We're starting from zero. And so all of us are going to be proceeding from that point. Um, it's like a race almost where the starting gun has gone off and now we wish to build our faith. And so we're going to be starting from no faith and building from there. Some areas will go faster than others. Um, even those areas that go faster, there's a lot of room to grow. So, so no big surprise if, if there's a lack of faith. Um, that's just the way it is. We want more faith than what we have. Um, how could we want more faith if we already had perfect faith? I mean, it's, it's all a growth deal. And so the point is, is that uh, we're cheering each other on. We're not condemning one another. We're not saying to people, well, if you had more faith than such and such, like blaming, condemning, judging, that is emphatically not what we're about. Uh, faith is the means by which obedience works. And who of us can claim to be perfectly obedient all the time in everything? So clearly, faith is something we're working on. And so if I'm not perfect in faith, then it's why would I expect my brother or my sister in the Lord to be perfect in faith? Um, what would I want? Do I want somebody to criticize me or condemn me? Oh, if, that's, if I don't want that, why would I do that to them? Why would I be judgmental? So what we're, we're aiming for is a very supportive environment where we're uh, cheering each other on. Now, we talked about the woman with the issue of blood. And, and she knew, and, and we're not going into detail on any of these things because we're just doing a quick, what I imagine to be a quick review of the things we've covered to this point. We're just wanting to get the essentials of faith. And this story is really good. She knew the decision had already been made before she even approached Jesus. Jesus, um, as the story unfolds, says to her at the end, it is your faith that has made you well. Well, it's from the beginning of the story that she had faith. She already knew the decision had been made to heal her. So this was no longer in question. The issues of God's will to heal her, God's ability to heal her, and God's time to heal her had all been satisfied in her heart already. The only remaining issue was a point of contact. Um, that is what she was saying according to the description of this story is that she said as she was approaching Jesus, if, if I only, only, see this was the only issue remaining in her heart, only, if only I may touch his clothes I shall be made well. What an interesting perspective that is. She had everything nailed down already. That is a good picture of faith is when we have it nailed down. We know his will, we know his ability, we know his timing, the timing is now, and it's just that point of contact that we're looking for. 
So uh, we're pointing out there's a simplicity to faith. Um, it's simple, but not necessarily easy. And we're going to, if we have time today, we're going to begin to touch on what, where the issue is. So the cripple at Lystra now is similar, very similar in a number of respects to the woman with the issue of blood. Now, how did he? It says in verse uh, Acts 14 again, verse 9, he said he had faith to be healed. Well, where did this come from? Was it magical, mystical? Did God just somehow give it to him? Did God favor him over other people? What happened? Uh, well, it's easy to see because we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We back up two verses to verse 7. It says, and there they were preaching the gospel. So clearly, the gospel includes God's will, not only for salvation, uh, forgiveness of our sins, but the gospel includes the fact that on that same cross, Jesus bore our sicknesses and carried our pains. And that is what Paul was preaching. That is what the man heard. That's how he had faith to be healed. Now notice that he had faith to be healed, but um, as of verse 9, where he had faith to be healed, he was still crippled. So his faith, good enough to heal him, had not yet healed him. Very interesting. Uh, we read again, verse 9, this man heard Paul speaking, and Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed. Let's stop right there, not verse 10 yet. The man had faith to be healed, but he was still crippled. Very important to see that. Verse 10, Paul said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet, and he leaped and he walked. And so this, just like the woman with the issue of blood, there was that point at which she touched uh, the clothes of Jesus, and in her heart and mind, it was like, now, there, I got it. Um, and in this case, Paul said with a loud voice, and the man responded, he acted on his faith, and it was like the instant in which he um, released his faith in, in making the effort to stand. He released his faith. The woman released her faith when she touched his clothes. He released his faith when he made the effort to stand, and he was healed in that instant. Wow, simple. Will of God, believe will of God, act upon it, simple, but not necessarily easy. That there's going to be um, sometimes on our part, and sometimes these will be significant, they'll take time for us to work through, other times um, not so much of a deal, but, but there's going to be heart issues. This woman had to have these heart issues um, settled uh, before the story happens. Same with um, the man. He needed to come quickly uh, to this place of faith in order um, for the story to unfold as it did. Now, side journey here for a minute. Um, faith, we're talking about faith that receives. Faith that, that obeys is, operates so similarly. I, I just I feel like I can't get to this place of the, the cripple at Lystra and just how this unfolded without pointing out the similarity with faith that obeys. Let's look at Ephesians 4, 29 to 32, for example. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. And actually, I have other verses I'd like to read, but for the sake of time, we'll just go to verse 29. That one is significant in itself. Let no corrupt communication out of proceed out of your mouth. That is supernatural. No human being can do that on their own, in their own power. Uh, in James, it says, no man can tame the tongue. Um, everybody's tongue is going to uh, utter things that it should not be uttered. That's the human nature. But here we're being told, let no, not some, not a little, don't cut it in, it's not, we're not being advised to, you know, cut it in half and that'll be good. Um, but we're being told, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Corrupt communication would be words that are not edifying to the hearer. Um, so then, how we do that is the very same way the man stood up. He was crippled from his mother's womb. He could not stand up, and we cannot properly control our tongue. So what happened? Um, Paul said to him, he had faith to be healed. He believed in the word of God. Paul said, stand up, and he stood up. And really, that's how righteousness works. It's the very same way, where we have a relationship with God. Our heart is open. He, we trust him. He tells us what to do. He says, let, for him to say, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth is identical to Paul saying to the cripple at Lystra, stand to your feet. It's in response to that word that, that uh, 
we then just simply do it. And at that point, it's no longer us doing it. It's the Word of God. It is the Holy Spirit um, <clears throat> animating us, enabling us, empowering us to do what we otherwise couldn't do. And, and that is how we live righteously. Now, we'll finish with this. Simple, back to the subject of simple, but not necessarily easy. It has to do with our heart. And, um, and we can, even if it, it's a job, and even if it takes some time, we can steer our heart. It's not as easy as steering our mind. Uh, our heart is more deep. It's more entrenched things in our heart, but we can steer our heart. Now, our heart is not naturally in the right condition. In Jeremiah 17, 9 to 10, uh, the writer says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? There's a lot of things in our heart we don't know. Now, my point isn't to say to you, all the listeners, or even to myself, that our heart is desperately wicked. It's deceitful above all things. That is the natural condition of everybody's heart. Uh, and now, you and I, having been practicing righteousness for some time, we understand that the righteousness, practicing righteousness, um, Jesus accompanies that with the sprinkling of his blood on our heart, cleansing our heart. The cleaner our heart is, the easier it is to work with our own heart. There aren't things lurking in there. Who can know it? You know, who knows what? You know, a person's heart can be like a trash bin uh, accumulating junk for, for years. Um, he, uh, so then we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, where he talks about the sanctifying work of the Spirit, which is this, it is to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. So every obedience to Jesus, every act of righteousness, um, there's an intervention by Jesus at that act of righteousness to sprinkle our heart with blood, which is an ongoing cleansing. And so um, our heart, as we go, it increasingly is not desperately wicked. It is increasingly not deceitful above all things. It becomes easier for us to just to quickly believe things, act on them, and get quick results. We read finally in 1 John 3, 22, and whatever we ask, we receive from Him. So now this is talking about faith that receives now. Whatever we ask, we receive from Him. And example, for example, healing would be something that we wish to receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. So then, um, so the more the more foundational thing is faith that gives to God, faith that gives our heart, gives our, our uh, devotion, gives our obedience to Him, faith that gives to God, because with that there's a cleansing, and then it's easier uh, for us to receive, and whatever we ask, we receive from Him. So we just need to keep working at it. Uh, there's going to be some issues that come quickly. There's going to be some other issues that do not come quickly. What do we do? We don't get discouraged. We, we stay focused on the Word of God. We know what His will is. We continue to believe His will, and we continue to exercise our faith in different ways. Um, and one of the ways is obedience. We example, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Um, not only is there grace to do it, but there's also cleansing that accompanies it, and we just grow, and we continue to grow. And some things that were difficult five years, of, years ago become easier now, or difficult five months ago become easier now. So we're, we're moving ahead. All right, thank you that you're with us. I'm moving ahead with you. You're moving ahead with me. We're all moving ahead together with God. Let's keep doing it.